Welcome to the Travel Like a Boss podcast, where we interview location-independent entrepreneurs that travel the world like a boss by being their own boss. Here's your host, Johnny FD. Hey guys, this is Johnny and welcome to another special episode of the Travel Like a Boss podcast. I'm here recording live from the Himalayas again on my second trek. This time we are going up to Gorapani Poon Hill, which is part of the Annapurna Sanctuary. And it's actually the other side of the Annapurna Circuit that I didn't get to see. Because if you listen to the last episode, the Annapurna Circuit episode, you'll know that I got altitude sickness about uh, five days up and I had to hike a couple days back down. So I got to see the beautiful kind of east side of the Annapurna Sanctuary, but I didn't get to see the west side. So for these next five days, that is the goal, doing the Poon Hill Gorapani Trek, which is going to have some beautiful views of the Annapurna Mountains. And the nice thing is this is going to be a slightly easier trek. It's only five days long uh, compared to 19, like the last one. And the highest elevation is going to be just over 3,200 meters, which is just over 10,000 feet. So there's uh, very little risk for altitude sickness. And as you told by my voice, even though I'm pretty much uh, recovered um, after a stint of getting sick and needing to take antibiotics, um, I'm still not 100%, so I didn't want to go up too high. But it's proved to be a beautiful hike so far, and I've already met some uh, really cool people, including uh, two friends from Japan that I met on the first day. Let me introduce you to them now. Uh, my name is Makoto. I'm from Japan. I want to see the beautiful place of the pond here. Yeah, I'm satisfied this day. Thank you. My name is Kai from Japan. I like mountain only. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> All right, so we're going to continue walking and we'll see what happens. Uh, I'm Deb Wolf from the Bay Area and I am trekking with Three Sisters Trekking from Nepal. And uh, I'm glad to meet Johnny so far. This is uh, my first full day on the trail. So, yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, but you've been to Nepal a few times before this, right? Yeah, yeah. I've been to Kathmandu twice before. And uh, I usually stay in Bodhnath. And, uh, yeah, Trangu Rinpoche is my teacher. And he's teaching, again, um, on Kempo Gangshar, his teacher, on uh, vivid awareness. So I get to practice before <laughs> I get to hear. <laughs> so you get to so you've been coming to Nepal to practice Buddhism. Mm -hmm. Do you think that being on the trek and just being in nature is a form of meditation in itself? Uh well, it's pretty crowded here, so you have to practice <laughs> some patience. <laughs> you know, what? I have noticed that, but at the same time, like what I like is even though there's a ton of people like literally we're going up this trail and there's probably like a hundred people surrounding, surrounding us, including some donkeys, which is pretty nice. But I realized that everybody here is putting themselves through kind of an enduring, tough trial. And, you know, people are willing to use squat toilets and sleep in, you know, not very nice conditions. So the type of tourists that come here, I feel like are very different than the ones that you would get to like, you know, Paris or somewhere where it's easier to be entitled or easier to be um, kind of uh, picky. Picky. Wow, yeah, it's pretty nice here. I just had some moosley this morning. <laughs> it's fully like Switzerland out here. So uh, I guess I appreciate that merging of Eastern and Western cultures, like even on that level and just like the trekking culture and the climbing culture back home that I'm a part of and seeing mutated here <laughs> in, since the 50s, really, which is, you know, pretty much the same story with Buddhism in the West. Yeah, that's true, right? <laughs> I guess we took uh, Buddhism from the East and we took a lot of, uh, I guess, action adventures from the West. And it's perfect because Nepal, you know, is not only the birthplace of Buddha, but also it is the home of the Himalayas, which is something you can't replicate anywhere else in the world. Yeah, Lumbini. I wish I could go there sometime. That story of Buddha's birth is really important to me because it's, uh, it's a struggle. His uh, Buddha's mom died in childbirth, and that's really the start of it. So he's a prince with all the luxuries, but there's a level of mendacity around royalty and um, material 
uh, luxuries because the dude was pretty sad. <laughs> and so I think that his, um, journey really speaks to me, like doing austerities and nature and like that didn't quite work, but I think really prepared the ground for him to give teachings in Sarnath, which where I like to go as well. So Sarnath and, um, Kathmandu, uh, Bodhnath is a very special place because the, tradition of teachings hasn't been broken. So there's been a full cycle of, of practice that's been unbroken, uh, unlike in other places where Buddhism has been squashed out by Muslim invaders and also by uh, communist invasions. And um, so it just kind of has always been in Nepal. And uh, yeah, you can feel it here. I'm looking forward to going around the stupa when I get home. Another cool. Another little journey. Yeah, I love it. And if you guys have never heard of the story of the Buddha, uh, it's a real life story. He's an actual real person that was actually born in Nepal. And the story is he was b- born into wealth. He was a prince. And he realized one day that all that money, all that luxury, all the servants didn't make him happy. So he went out and decided to give it all up and become a monk and basically figure out what is the meaning of life and what is the purpose of us being here? What is happiness? What is important? And that is why he's called the enlightened one. Uh, cause I guess he's a, you know, he figured it out and he passed down his teachings to others, but it's really cool because it's something we can all aspire to be because he's not this mythical, you know, figure from millions of years ago. Um, he was, you know, a real person. And that's why Buddhism isn't really considered religion. It's just a, a way of life. Yeah, the way, the path. So she get back on the path. <laughs> yeah. It's time to go. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's enjoy this hike. So I'm taking a break here. We just had lunch uh, and Meg's guide is with Three Sisters, which is a really cool guide company. It's the first one that it's female run and uh, all the guides are female. And what's really crazy is I looked at the stats and... Last year, in October, there were, I think, something like, was it 3,000, um, w- whatever it was, it was like, you know, X amount of trackers, and then there was 3,000 male guides, and then there was 40 female guides. So she's one of those 40. Hi, namaste, my name is Tristi Tamang, and I'm from Pokhara, and I'm a guide. I have been working five years, and three sister for... Yeah, five years for uh, three sister. I have been working, and then now I'm Goripani Gandruk trek for this trek. Yeah. So in those five years, have you met a lot of interesting people? Yes, so many, <laughs> many different kinds of people. Yeah, they are very good. Yeah. And in those five years, has have things changed a lot? How, like, how is it being a, a female guide? Because it's not very popular, right? Yes, but uh, uh, in Pokhara, there is a uh, three sister. It's only for female. And then there is so many female guides. And then now uh, there is uh, like a 200 uh, female uh, guide and assistant. So, yes, that is uh, one of the female tracking uh, agency like company. Oh, nice. So I, I'm actually curious from, from Meg why you chose uh, to go with Three Sisters because I know in other countries safety would be a, a big part of it, but Nepal is pretty safe. So was there like another reason or was it that the concern? Um, it's the reference that I got. My friend Ray uh, came to Nepal maybe 15 years ago and he was just going to trek around. He's a pretty um, solid guy. And his mom was worried about him trekking alone in Nepal because there's advisories against that. So he promised his mom he would get a guide. And so he had heard of three sisters and so he wanted to support them. And, uh, so yeah, shout out to Ray, Jokey Ray. And, um, so from that personal reference, I decided to do the same thing and, uh, yeah, look them up. They have good website so that's always a good criteria for me and uh responsive online booking and um a good um sort of organization and description of the various uh hikes you could do and i was looking for a specific time slot um and uh, they were able to accommodate it so that's that's how it worked for me yeah that's awesome and i think it's a a good cause to support too and it's cool that they are you know basically just creating an industry um that was 
you know, really just for men. Uh, so now if women want to, you know, be a guide or, you know, even if they want to be a porter, they want to, and, you know, it's not like it's a great job being a porter, but I think everyone should have the opportunity to be able to take any job they want, you know, whether you know, it's a great job or not, that should be their option to do. Yeah. So I'm actually trekking alone without a guide this time because I had a really bad experience with my guide going to Annapurna Circuit. I didn't know that. Yeah. And it was so frustrating having him that I was like, you know what, I'd rather take the, the chance of dying than have to deal with that again. But I think it was just kind of bad luck. You know, I, I think I didn't vet the the guy or the, you know, I didn't read you know reviews uh, about the company. You know, hanging out with you and your guide, I can tell she's really knowledgeable. She actually cares about your safety and, you know, and she's actually showing you like really cool kind of tips, you know, and about the nature and pointing out the different mountains and summits. So, if I had a guy like that, I would have been really happy. Um, but this is kind of like my my journey to kind of uh, shed kind of that bad experience. So that's why I'm tagging along with you. Hmm. <laughs> Great. Okay. I thought you were with the, the some group and that we just were on the same uh, rhythm. But okay. Yeah. Orphans are welcome. <laughs> so my name's Nicola I'm from Manchester in England and the flowers on this jungle section of the route are incredible such vibrant colors pink red white ones just you just keep looking up I have to be careful not to trip they are uh, beautiful so these are the national flowers of of Nepal right do you know what they're called I thought they're rhododendrons, but I don't know if if maybe they have a different name. I thought most of them are rhododendrons. I know it's famous, this path, for tons of rhododendrons in this season, but I'm not sure if the actual Nepalese or Latin name, I don't know. Yeah, I, I've heard that name as well, so I think that's what it is. But I thought they were all red, but I see like pink ones, you said yeah. you saw white ones, so... If you like flowers, I guess you'll like this track, right? Yeah. Oh, definitely. It's what I was looking forward to in the jungle section and for coming in this spring season. It's the only time I think you get it lined with so many flowers. So it's fantastic. Oh, that's true because the other main tour season is October. Yeah. And the fact that we're here in March right now, it's uh, it's kind of the bloom time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't think you get them in... October, November must be winter season and they're not out and this is one of the benefits of trekking now. You get the colourful flowers. Alright, well, let's enjoy the flowers and enjoy the trek. Okay, my name is Anna. I come from Finland. I'm 26 years old. This is my first trek and we're going to go go to Korepani and Poon Hill. This is heavy as hell (laughs) and hot as hell. Uh, I prefer the morning temperature, cold, nice, very nice, but I like it. I think I'll come another time. So to be fair, it's it's not that hot at all. It's like <laughs> probably in the like seventy five degrees Fahrenheit, which is like twenty two <laughs> Celsius, and you're not carrying a bag. <laughs> you have a bag of snacks though, right? What's in the bag? Uh, there's water and and then my clothes and actually not snacks. There is actually a bottle of wine. Oh, okay. We might be friends uh, on top of the trail. <laughs> And her friend that actually uh, is holding one of the, uh, what do you call these flowers? Laligras. Laligras. Is this the national flower? Oh, nice. Okay. So. Yeah. So my name is Julia and I come also from Finland and I'm a cousin of Anna and I'm enjoying this trek a lot. Whose idea was it to come on this trek? I think it, it was the beer. Beer's idea. <laughs> we, oh, yeah, well, wine. We were drinking and then we just bought plane tickets. <laughs> yeah, we had two options to come to Nepal or go to Bali, and we decided to come here. That's so random. So you were at a, a at a bar drinking or at home? Uh, in a bar. Okay, so you're at a bar in Finland having some. Wine or wine, beer, wine some beer. Both, probably both, <laughs> and you just randomly were like, "Oh, let's let's go for a hike in Nepal." Basically, yes. And and what do you think of? Uh, do you regret this decision yet? No, no, I think we won't ever regret regret this. No. I love it. So how do you say, uh, "Let's let's go" or "Let's move on"? Oh, noni. All right, noni. 
All right, so we arrived to our guest house here in Gorpani, and it's actually a really nice village. I can actually see myself hanging out here for a few days even. It's um, on top of the mountain, so it's pretty high up, but it's like pretty built up, I think, just because so many people pass through here. And what was really crazy is looking at some of the shops, they have you know, full-on bookstores. They sell a ton of, you know, just kind of snacks and candies and we bought some playing cards and i didn't realize until i was was speaking to one of the guides that they still till this day carry everything up either on the back of a porter or on a mule so like on a donkey and that's why he was saying yeah things are a little bit more expensive and i was actually saying to him i was like i bought a pack of playing cards for dollar fifty which is pretty much the same price as i would get in pokhara or one of the other cities And I was like, no, it's great. It's a great deal. It's fine. I don't mind paying a little bit more, you know, um, especially being, you know, this remote and having the comforts of things like a hot water shower or, you know, even just being, you know, indoors and having a hot cooked meal. But what was really crazy is we were sitting at the German bakery and yes, they have a German bakery here where I had a black forest cake, which is really nice. And a, ironically, a German couple walked in at like probably 6.30 PM, which is, it was, you know, it was after dark and they asked for a room and the owner said, Oh yeah, you know, you're lucky we have one left. And remember, most of us got there at like 4 PM. So they were really lucky to find a room and, you know, they went to take a look at the room and they're like, Oh yeah, it's, you know, it's fine. And then they tried to negotiate the price. And here's what really drove me nuts was they were not in a position to negotiate. I know that in Nepal in general, because they kind of want your business so bad and because honestly, they don't make very much money from the room anyways. They make money from the dinner or the or the breakfast that you buy. A lot of places will give you the room for free if you you know agree to buy dinner and breakfast there. But when they're busy, there's no reason for them to negotiate. And even then, it's like, I almost kind of feel bad asking for it in the first place. So normally I, I don't, unless I'm, you know, happen, you know, I happen to be walking with people, you know, who are on a kind of tighter budget and we're like, okay, let's use the extra money we would save from the room to buy some more food or buy some dessert or some drinks or something. But these guys basically negotiated for like 20, 30 minutes on the price of the room. And the price of the room is $3. You heard me right. It's three dollars US, which is like two euros and fifty cents, and they're a couple, which means they were negotiating for over twenty minutes on the last room at probably the nicest guest house here in Gorapani, over three dollars, and it drove me nuts. I just automatically thought, why are you doing this? And if the money is that important, if you're that on, you know on tight of a budget. You shouldn't be here. You should be home saving up. You should be working. You should either figure out how to make, you know, some money freelance or get a job somewhere, you know, pick fruit in, in um, Australia for a while to save up or, you know, teach English or do something where don't come to Nepal and try to negotiate for $3, especially on someone's last room. And it just, it's one of those things where like, I, I'm all for budget traveling and saving money and understand that, you know, people want to extend their trips, but this is not the way to do it, guys. And I'm so glad that most of you listening to this podcast are, have the mindset of let's make more money so we can, you know, have good experiences. Not, let's not overpay. Let's not get ripped off. Let's not, you know, artificially drive up the prices of things, but let's also support the local economy and let's pay people a fair, you know, amount. And I think that's uh, a big lesson from today. But anyways, I'm about to head to bed because we have to be up at 4.30 in the morning tomorrow to start walking at 5 a.m. so we can make the sunrise on Poon Hill, which by the way, I don't know why they call it a hill because it's at 3,200 meters, which is like 10,000 feet. But um, have a good night, guys, and I'll see you in the morning. So it's the morning of day three, and uh, I've been up since 4.30 in the morning walking up to the uh, Poon Hill view, um, and let's hear from some people on top of the mountain to see how they feel. 
Good morning, this is Sarah from Germany and I'm here with uh, Grit, my colleague and friend and our two guides and yeah, we had a nice um, a few steps this morning, nice workout, but we feel great. So we just wait for the sunrise and it's a bit cloudy by now, but yeah, we'll clear up. So we have a beautiful day. <laughs> How many uh, steps did you estimate? Because I felt like it would it went f forever. It was, it was only supposed to be an hour, but it really felt like like a forever torture. I think it was pretty much exactly 22 million steps. <laughs> I could definitely see that. <laughs> so uh, here is her guide. Yeah, my name is Man Bahadur Magar. Um, I'm working guide for the you know trekking just today is a little bit um cloudy weather is not really clear but it's still people are surrounding um viewpoint punil and uh walking is some people is comfortable some people is a little bit harder for the climb up like um hour and then some people take it um hour and a half some people ask it's very difficult to walk and some people is very enjoy and very comfortable. I'm definitely not one of the people who is comfortable, but I knew it would be worth it at the end. <laughs> so I have a question for you. So we are at 3,200 meters, which is over 10,000 feet. Why do you call this a hill and not a mountain? Um, no, this, this one is um, normally, you know, normal places we calling, but um, for foreigners people, is, this one is um, quite higher and um, a little bit difficult for them. For Nepali people, it's, it's okay. We can manage for the comfortable way. <laughs> so you, and the crazy thing is, I'm in four layers of clothes. I have on a down jacket, I have on like two fleeces, and uh, like some under armor. He is literally the only guy, only person on the mountain that's wearing a t-shirt right now. <laughs> Do you, are you not afraid of the cold? No, just um, I feeling is very hot. Yeah, oh just that's why um, I wear just only, you know, a tiny t-shirt. I, I think he's insane. Everyone else is literally in like four layers of, of down jacket. And it looks like a North Face commercial because of all the uh, knockoff uh, North Face rentals in, in Nepal. Okay, my name is Dmitry. I'm from Russia, Moscow. I'm uh, 38 years old and I'm happy to be here. It's a very good uh, place. So that's all I think. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Dina. I'm from Moscow. <laughs> Very good idea <laughs> to go. Ладно, короче, не дашь сказать. Игорь, что это смешно? Hello, I am Anna. Uh, it's beautiful place. It's a very energetic place. Uh, I'm happy. <laughs> I think the funniest thing is uh, the stereotype that Russian people are not afraid of the cold, but all of them are just like holding hot tea and just looking uh, miserable. <laughs> Russians never look miserable. <laughs> Remember that. <laughs> I think it's always uh, never look happy, never look miserable, never look uh, any emotion. <laughs> So for you, you're smiling. What is your name? Where are you from? Uh, I'm Inger. We are from Moscow. We are traveling all over the world. It's our six months in travel. So we are happy to be in Himalaya and to see the sunrise. And four o'clock in the morning, it's usual our wake up. So <laughs> if you want to see a good uh, sunrise, wake up and go on. So you... Normally, you say you normally wake up at four in the morning. Uh, not, it's not a normal, but when we are going to see a sunrise in some places like a Machu Picchu, like a Kolka Canyon, in, or so four o'clock in the morning, it's a usual wake up when you, I, when you are going to see a sunrise, yeah. And so you've already been to some other mountains like Machu Picchu? How, 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 how does this compare? Uh, I guess uh, the same amount of people, so they are climbing in the four o'clock with the uh, flight, with the lighter, yeah, and a lot of people, but they are so encouraged and they are going, 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 and then you feel the power and energy because uh, of people, yeah, because of the cr of this crowd. So to compare, it's it can't be comparable yeah because uh, it's a little bit different but anyway it's amazing yeah 
Hi, my name's Pearl Shears from Melbourne, Australia, and I managed to get trekking sickness on the morning we left. <laughs> Wait, at like 700 feet? Yep, in Pokhara. How, how's that possible? Um, a bad fruit lassie is my guess, but it has now lasted about three days and is not showing any signs of stopping. Okay, so it wasn't um, altered sickness, it was just like Nepali food sickness. Yeah. Yes, yep. All right, well, we'll get you some uh, charcoal or some carbon and we'll sort you out. <laughs> oh, yeah. All I've been having lately is just straight soup and I'm, I'm a bit tired of it. <laughs> yeah, but you made it to the top. What do you think of the view? <laughs> At the moment, I'm just seeing some clouds, but when they go away, it's it was worth the walk up. Yeah. Hey, I'm Cam. I'm also from Melbourne and I am not taking any drugs and I'm hoping that I'm not going to get sick <laughs> and it's going quite well for me so far. Hey, I'm Sam from Melbourne. I am taking drugs, and I think I've got what Pearl got. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, what do you guys say? Drugs? What, what are you guys talking about? Uh, like, like altitude sickness stuff. Altitude sickness pills. Gastro and stop. Gastro, gastro stop. stop and this, oh, any, whatever else anyone's back. taking. So I didn't. I didn't think that that was required at all because we were like just at the point of where people would start getting altitude sickness. What, what made you decide to take it? Uh, well, you meant to start taking it before you go up, yeah. and we're, we're heading to base camp. So, yeah, you, you want to talk about that? <laughs> uh, yep, <yeah>, sure. <laughs> Maybe talk here. <laughs> yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Otto from Melbourne, Australia, and um, we're doing the Annapurna Sanctuary Walk. So we reach um, Annapurna Base Camp, which is. 4,000, yeah, 100 metres above sea level, so that'll be exciting. I think the um, altitude sickness is only going to get worse, so something to look forward to. Or non-existent, but um, got to hope for the best there, I guess. Thanks. All right, best of luck, guys. Hey, I'm Daniel. I'm with these guys. I'm from Melbourne. Um, I've been feeling great about the track so far, uh, and it's just it's been amazing, and this view is stunning, so it's been worth getting up at 4.30 and trekking through the pitch black <laughs> yeah it's been good especially from where you're standing because you're like two meters tall right <laughs> yeah yeah exactly <laughs> get to see over all the tourists <laughs> my name is carol and i'm from canada and i think this is just phenomenal what made you decide to come on the trek uh we just retired and we wanted to do something a bit challenging um and he's been to nepal before so i thought why not and has it been challenging Yes. <laughs> so far, yes. And the best is yet to come. Hi, I'm John from Chase, BC, Canada. And the trek has been awesome so far and more to come. Challenging. Yesterday was the most challenging. Good training ground for the rest. So you said you just retired. How old are you and how do you think that uh, kind of affects the, the trek? Does that make it better because you have less responsibilities and nothing to worry about? Or does it make it harder because, you know, you're no longer a 20 year old spring chicken? <laughs> well, I think it's harder on our lungs, but I think a little older, we may acclimatize when we go up higher. I've actually heard that where they did statistics on people who get altitude sickness and the people in their 50s and 60s almost never get it because partially it's just wisdom of not pushing yourself and not, you know, uh, going, you know, higher when you, when you start getting symptoms. But also a lot of it is just walking slower while the biggest age group that gets altitude sickness is people between the 20s and 30s just because, you know, first off, fitness wise, they might just kind of push up a little bit too fast. But second, I think it's just life lessons that we haven't learned yet. I totally agree. Yes, for sure. So any life lessons you want to leave us listeners? Take the time to smell the roses. Don't be in such a big hurry. Take your time. Enjoy it. It's a journey, not the destination. And what about you? Don't wait for tomorrow. Do it now. Tomorrow may never come. All right. You guys heard it on top of the Himalayan mountains. Let's go out and do it. Thank you. So we're really lucky on our way down, literally 15 minutes walking down the path back down to Gorpani. The air just clears and the fog clears and we have such a beautiful view of all of the peaks. Literally, we can see all of the mountains and it is so beautiful. And the fog just kind of lifted and we feel like we're so high up and just all around us is just snow-capped mountains 
and I made this walk completely worth it. And I'm really glad I stuck around till almost the very end. I'm almost one of the last people on top of the mountain still. But we are awarded, I guess, for our patience with these views. So I just got down from Poon Hill and the first thing that the guest house owner tells me is that my Finnish friend came back and she was vomiting blood and she got a helicopter back to Kathmandu. And it's crazy because just last night I was sitting in this dining room playing cards with her all night and she was completely fine. And this morning I saw her on top of Poon Hill, which remember we call it a hill because it's one of the lowest you know, kind of viewpoints in Nepal. And she wasn't feeling well. She started throwing up a bit. And I told her, hey, you know, the only way this is going to get better if you, if you go down. And I, and I, and I said, I know you want to stay, you know, and see the view. And I understand, but you know, like you need to get down and you'll feel better. And little did I know that how bad it would be. I mean, it's crazy that at 3,200 meters, uh, which is, I guess the same altitude that I got sick on the Annapurna circuit trek, but it, she really, really hit her bad and really quick as well. The you know, guest house owner says it might have something to do with her being on some other medication and that triggering it, you know, and often with altitude sickness, it's not just the altitude. Um, it's sometimes like a mix between that and something else that's happening. So for me, on the Annapurna circuit, my immune system is compromised because I had gotten a, a cold or a flu and then I got bronchitis or, you know, something. And then the altitude really kicked in. And because my body was already at a kind of weakened state, the altitude really kicked in. And I have a feeling that it was the same thing for her. But what's really insane is I remember walking down those, you know, 3,000 steps from Boone Hill back down to Gorpani and seeing a helicopter, seeing a helicopter, you know, like just basically swirling around and not really thinking anything of it. You know, sometimes we see things like that and we never consider it being someone we know, you know, that someone that, you know, we spend time with a friend. And I, I feel so bad because I, I just went into her room and I noticed that she had left that bottle of wine that they had brought up on the trail. And obviously that's the last thing that they're thinking about. But all that is left in their room right now is that flower she was carrying yesterday, the the rhododum, and that bottle of wine. And it's really just kind of like a spooky feeling. So I really hope that she recovers uh, quickly. I'm glad she is going all the way down to Kathmandu and getting help. It's a shame that she, you know, wasn't able just to rest. I was actually going to advise to her to just stay in Gorpani another night and just rest here before moving on because for our next step that we were supposed to walk together, you go up a little bit in elevation again and then back down. So even though we are technically at the top of our, our hike at the Poon Hill, we're, there's going to be a lot of up and down still and a lot of uh, strenuous walking. So it's not recommended if you are suffering from altitude sickness to push your body through that. So it would have been probably for, for most cases a wise decision just to stay in Gorpani another night and see if you recover. But, you know, when you're vomiting blood, I guess the smart, rational thing to do is going to be just take a helicopter to Kathmandu and get some real help. So... Hopefully she's gonna be okay. Unfortunately, I, I don't have uh, any way to contact her, but let's um, you know let's keep an eye out. Uh, Anna from Finland, if you are hearing this, or Julia, let us know uh, how she's doing, and we'll keep her in our thoughts. Okay, can you just say what happened? Ah, actually, when after you know she come back uh, from the Pune Hill, then when they reach. She reached here and suddenly she, she said uh, she's not feeling well and suddenly like she's shaking her like you know body and like then she went to the restroom and she started vomiting and with the blood a slightly blood and she was also worried and after came out and said she just suddenly fell down and whole body was shaking all the way like that thr, 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 like that and, and we are just also you know panic and what happened what happened then she said don't know i not even she cannot talk like that and just start uh, some of them they start rubbing their hands like that and just making just 
straight like that and later on she said just uh, just sleep on the like flat area and we just bring her and later on she still still you know shaking like the all the way and later on what we do just we just uh, i told to her uh, those guide guy guy they said just call the emergency we'll just call the nurse first and after nurse she bring her she said uh, it's like this you have to care like that and later on she did something and later on she said we have to call emergency helicopter like that for emergency purpose then we bring helicopter and we took to her there and the nurse i think she gave because she's taking pills as well early morning she took she said but later on also when she's just a little normal and the while in helipad ground and she said i want to take one more pills and they start taking that pills after later on she was a little calm yeah. do, do you know what pills she was taking that i don't know because he said she's taking almost from the 4 months ago onward like that so he's taking that pills yeah. yeah that's it yeah so i wonder if it's uh some kind of interaction with the pills because we're not uh, so i know that around 3000 yeah. people can start to get altitude yeah, sickness yeah, yeah. but how often do you see it here in uh, pune hill that type of i have seen some but it's not similar like the, because some different different kind some you know some people uh, i have seen some while sleeping they just they lost their life like that because some of them they are taking some different different kind of medicine here in the high altitude you know and some they are sick but they come they wanted to come in the himalayas like that they come and they face such pro like that you know incident happened and even to a few week ago while old man is, is above around 70 a, between 80 like uh, she was he was okay like he took like he take rest here and while he just uh, you know uh, check out time they went nearby little high area they are up going to the tadapani on the way he suddenly fell down and he's he's he lost his life like that happened here yeah. wow yeah. That's so crazy i know Because it's crazy those, yeah uh, sorry those you know who's taking medicines like that you know in their countries wherever like that they have to you know clear cut when they come out nearby the himalayas because some some they forget to take medicine like that unfortunately by mistake like, you know and some like it's happened like that i have seen because of some especially those people who like you know sick from inside but they wanted to come here they they were they're facing such problem yeah in himalayas yeah i think part of it is you know as tourists you know most people are fine and thousands of people come every year yeah. with no problems yeah. we take beautiful photos we yeah. go, we go home we tell everyone oh it's so beautiful you should go mm-hmm. and we sometimes don't um, realize that it's it's not that it's dangerous it's that it's um the himalayas you know is a powerful mountain yeah. and sometimes we forget that sometimes we just think oh it's just yeah. just for fun yeah. but i think we need to respect the mountain more yeah, sure. and you know really take care of ourselves before we we come yeah so i'm curious um when you see people get like you know let's say minor uh, altitude sickness they wake up they are fatigued yeah. uh, they cannot eat yeah. If they just have you ever seen people just stay an extra night and then how are they are they better the next day or do they normally have to go down Uh, normally what we suggest you know some i have seen they are sick like that some for example high altitude sickness we advise you to don't because of course body you have to care, care of course yourself yeah just quit the queue like the track just go down like that we suggest like that we, we have we did like that also so many and we just call them their guide or some of them when they go down they said ah they are normal because some of them because of high altitude they face the problem yeah Yeah. Okay, well it's good to hear that um when they go down usually the problems go away. I think this is also a uh, important reminder that everybody should get travel insurance. Uh I just wrote a big blog post on johnnyft.com just look for insurance and I talk about what I personally use but I I think, you know, whether you come to Nepal and the Himalayas or if you're just going to Thailand, everybody should have some kind of travel insurance just in case because you never know what'll happen. All right. So I'm going to be walking down to uh Terapani now. Thank you very much. Namaste. Yeah, namaste. Namaste. Dhanyawad. Yeah. Have a take. Yeah, nice take. Yeah. Take care. All right. So we just climbed for about an hour or two uh from Gorpani to I think it's a Tata Tatapol Tatapani. Yeah, now uh, we now from Gorpani on our way to Tatapani. And I just met a nice group from somewhere in the UK and they had just mentioned that one of their friends or one of the people that they're traveling with had just had to uh get airlifted out as well and it really just blew my mind because 
this track, the Gorpani Poon Hill, is really known as the kind of easy track out of all the Himalaya ones. But I, I just want to just share the story because I want you guys to know that even though it is the easier track, things still happen. Okay, so I'll just give a very concise version of what's happened. And then we've also got a medic with us and also another two, two trained medics at the side of me who, if you want to have more detail, you can have that. Um, so basically, the person in question had been trekking with us for uh, two days. And on the third day, um, she'd been feeling unwell during the day. And this presented as a little bit of bal- balance problems, but not enough to consider altitude sickness of any kind but then we had vomiting and tiredness and headaches but all very low level things till we got um, to 2,900 meters um, in Gorapani and it was very apparent um, that this person then on checking when the medics became involved that her oxygen levels were very low and this is the point I'll pass over to the two people who were medically involved. Okay, okay, so uh, I think what I would say is that the initial assumption uh, or fear was this was altitude sickness, but actually our guide and I think our general view was this was not high enough to cause the significant respiratory problem that she had. And therefore, there was a concern as to, is there something else? So the local me- medics saw her and assessed her um, uh, and and... We treated initially for altitude sickness, but I don't think any of us are really convinced that that is what it was. The same thing happened with the Finnish girl, where the amount of um, kind of trauma that she had, she, I wasn't there for it, but it sounded like she might have had a seizure. And she was just really, like she got back to the guest house and she was on the floor and she just couldn't get up and she was vomiting with a little bit of blood. And they believed that it had to be an a combination of something else happening along with altitude sickness because it's, you know, altitude sickness is a very uh, severe thing, but usually at this altitude, at 3,200 meters, um, it doesn't get this severe. Well, I know I just to add to what my medical colleague said, we did everything that we felt was, was necessary. And, and for her safety, we, we finally decided that the only way we could deal with this was to, was to airlift her to a safe haven, a hospital in Kathmandu, where she'll be seen to, um, at the hospital and take her from there and investigate further. So that's, that was the decision we had to come to. Yes. Uh, the only thing I would say is that, uh, obviously the primary medical team he, uh, in Gorapani did their best. Mm. But if anybody is out there wanting to improve medical facilities, they didn't have any oxygen left. Okay. Uh, and, and, and I think they have one oxygen cylinder. And I think it is that if things, if things go well, that's fine. But actually, I think, uh, as I say, if you, if you're thinking about improving things, that is something that I think would be really helpful. And similarly, along the same lines, it's the guesswork, but potentially they may have other oxygen, but because a lot of the guides here then head off on other treks, um, which pretty much run straight after the ones they're doing, they pick up supplies along the way. So it may be that they were already sectioned off to take a certain amount of supply elsewhere, and they don't want to use that. So, for instance, our guide, after leaving us, is flying the next day to Lukla and then off to Everest. So they take those supplies from the point they leave to the point they go. So it might not be that there isn't any... Uh, oh, okay. it, it's difficult to ascertain. So if it had become really serious, I think they yeah. probably would have provided okay. from somewhere. Oh, okay. But like, we're, but we did experience n- not n- not enough I yesterday. think maybe it's also down to trekking companies, isn't it, that run from centrally from Kathmandu. I mean, I did a trek long 20 years ago on the Annapurna circuit, and it was run very, very rigidly, and particularly with altitude. Where, you know, the rules were very, very strict mm. about descent and what you did from there. Mm. So may, maybe more could be done sort of with the trek companies to facilitate the supplies. Possibly because of the altitude being the one that you wouldn't necessarily expect people to experience severe symptoms or any kind of symptoms particularly maybe that's why it's not deemed as important as far as the guides and Sherpas and everyone else is concerned. 
I, yeah. I just say, and it's all down to teamwork. People <laughs> will trek together, and that's what trekking's about: teamwork and caring for each other. So yeah. that's my final yeah. word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Too. yeah, yeah, yeah. We did. A, well, they did a fab job. I mean, we all. It's a team effort, and when you come on a group mm. trip. Um, you are very reliant on the good people around you. Yeah, I definitely agree. And thanks for sharing all that with us. Okay. How's it going? My name's Jonathan. I'm in Nepal here with my six-year-old, my three-year-old, and my wife. Uh, we are living the international expat lifestyle. We are from the United States, most recently in Alaska, but we've been living in India and now most recently in Dubai. So I wish you the best of luck with your podcasts. I wish you the best of luck with your track. It's pretty cool seeing like, your kids like you have how does that actually work with the the porters the guides like having such young kids on the trek so the best thing about uh, our situation with young kids and traveling in Nepal and porters, I really view it as a way for us to give back to the local economy. So for us, uh, with our young children, we basically have one porter per child, and then my wife and I share a porter, and it, it works out well. So we do, I think there's, like, we're a family of four, and we have, I think, five porters here uh, in Nepal that are helping us with our trek. And so it's just a great way, again, for us to give back, and I'm looking forward to giving nice, generous tips to everybody at the end. Yeah, I think that's great because it's providing all these jobs and it's something that there's no way, you know, you'd be able to hire five, you know, people from Switzerland or something to do this. This is like one of probably the few places in the world where this is even an option. Definitely, I agree with you. And the other thing, too, is um, we are not the only ones with children out here. So we've seen a few other families with, uh, you know, kind of that below 10 age group. So I think where we might say, you know, we've got these kids, maybe we shouldn't travel or maybe we shouldn't go to Nepal. We're actually really embracing it. And then uh, where I grew up in the Midwest, uh, you know, my outdoor adventure was kind of the KOA campground. My own children are, you know, they've been to Sri Lanka, they've been to Nepal, uh, all over India. And so they're just getting this uh, great opportunity to meet people, interact with all the different cultures. And I hope that really kind of sets their foundation for the rest of their lives. I like it. I think a lot of people with young kids are going to be, would be afraid of going on a trek like this, you know, the, the dangers, um, maybe even altitude sickness. Did you consider all that? And, and like, wh- like, what are your thoughts on it? Sure. So uh, it's a great question. And before we went international, well, first off, being from the Midwest, when I decided to hike the Appalachian Trail, everyone thought I was crazy and how dangerous that would be. And then ultimately I met my wife. Uh, we moved to Taos, New Mexico. We moved to Alaska. And each one of those moves brought out that same kind of fear, not so much from my wife and I, but from our family and friends. Like, oh, that's crazy. I don't think you should do that. And then Alaska to our first international assignment in Chennai, India, uh, it was just the end of the world. But now at this point, every time we do these moves, um, you know, I think there's a lot of pride that comes out. Um, and people really like to live vicariously through us, which I think is really good for, again, it's, it's no judgment against anyone who never left where they grew up. Um, but for us, it's just been a uh, neat opportunity to experience these cultures. And had we, I mean, there's always going to be doubt. And even on this trip to Nepal, it's like, well, you know, the kids are kind of young, but it, you know, we've, we've been steered really well so far. We've had a lot of, um, you know, just great experiences following our passions. And I, I would say that, you know, Knowing that fear is going to be there, but like overseeing, like kind of overcoming that, you know, it helps. And again, we've had this enriching experience because of it. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I think it's one of those things where if we're always afraid and we just stay home, we stay home in the Midwest, something could still happen. And if anything, you know, by going out on these adventures, it's almost kind of preparing us um, for something more. So uh, to that, you know, uh, my 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 wife's mother said, you know, oh, you shouldn't do these treks. You're going to have bad knees when you get older. And, you know, she's the one who really didn't do a lot of this stuff. And it's having the knee replacements from kind of maybe a, a more sedentary lifestyle. So it is true. I mean, um, there there is risk, but the rewards are, are well worth it. Again, even as a family of four, having these opportunities, um, it's just been been wonderful. And I will say our viewpoint of the Middle East before we, now that we live there, I mean, it's totally changed. We've met the most wonderful people uh, in the Middle East and, and just people are friendly, always opening up their house to us. And uh, our viewpoint from kind of the Western media is, you know, what you can imagine it would be. I love it. So I hope you guys put that excuse out of your minds uh, for not traveling. I'm Melissa. I'm from France. I'm doing the trek of uh, Punil and it's my first trek and it's Wonderful. Difficult, but wonderful. 
I like the pause between wonderful and difficult. <laughs> what did you? How how hard do you think this is uh, compared to what you had imagined? It's how I imagine. <laughs> no, no more and no less. <laughs> So unfortunately, your your friend got a little bit sick on the on the trail. <laughs> Do you want to say hello? Hello, but right now I'm better, so it's okay. I enjoy, and it was difficult, but uh, so amazing. But uh, I think that's the way I give it a, an advice. The way to Naya pull into uh, Fedi is better than the other way. And because there is a lot of stairs, really, a really a lot of stairs. <laughs> so you're saying it's better to do it uh, the opposite direction? So like、um, instead of doing it clockwise, like all of us did it, do it counterclockwise? Exactly, because、uh, it's better to get up with the stairs and get down with the way like that. Because for the for the leg, it's、uh, horrible, <laughs> just horrible. <laughs> we are young, eh? We are not old. We are young. <laughs> I must say, enjoy your trek. <laughs> so after a really long day of waking up at 4:30 in the morning to go up to Poon Hill, we had a even longer walk to Grand Duke, and on the way met two cool Finnish girls to replace the ones that had to get airlifted down. So you guys, I don't know if you realize you're my replacement Finnish friends. Hello, I'm Hannah. <laughs> Sorry, no, you have to ask me something. I will. So we got to Gradjuk pretty pretty early, around like 3 p.m., and all the guest houses were already full. Like we literally went door to door to six of them, and they were all completely full. And our only two options was either to walk 45 minutes to the next village, or to all just share a a three bed room. <laughs> And I'm so glad we did because this morning when we woke up, the the views just completely cleared up. What did you think of it? It was amazing. Yeah, we we see the whole like mountains better than the Boon Hill when we were like at the top. So it was very nice. Yeah, and I think yesterday was a little bit of a disappointment because of the fog. And、yes. do you think that、um, today made up for it? Yeah, totally. <laughs> so, I highly advise to everyone that if you're going to do this trek, to make sure you stay in Grandjur because you have a second day and a second chance of seeing the mountains. If anything, they're a little bit closer. So we were just walking down the trail. And we saw these beautiful water buffaloes, and I turn around and I see Hannah just slowly falling off the side of the mountain. What happened, Hannah? I don't know. I look look. Back and then I was like falling. <laughs> and the funniest thing was her sister was like one foot away from her, so I think she could have just grabbed her. And I'm on like the other side of the road, so I'm not far, but I'm like you know way further than her sister. And I was thinking, her sister's gonna grab her. There's no way she's gonna let her just like fall. And in slow motion, I see Anna just kind of, almost kind of. Just like give up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what happened. I was too tired. So, <laughs> and we we're so lucky that it was just a ditch, and it was probably only like two meters, you know, deep at the most or something. But it literally in slow motion. I just see her like slowly fall off the mountain <laughs> and into the ditch. And I like tried to reach for her, and I fall on the floor, like re- like reaching out. And I would like to say that if it really was a mountain, I would have been able to like hold her and pull her up. But I don't think so. I think I would have just let her die. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. Thank you for saving me. So, <laughs> so we tried,、um, but these、uh, water buffalo are actually following us on the trail now. So. It's quite nice, and、um, it's kind of a, a nice change from being up high and seeing the beautiful mountains. Because we've just been going through jungle all day today, and we're gonna try to get down to the next village, Grand Duke, and decide what to do from there. All right, everyone. So it's been a fun couple of days of trekking, but the journey is now close to an end. We just walked. A couple hours,、um, about four hours down to, to Grand Duke, 
and a bit past it uh, on our way to Kimchi where the bus station is. But we randomly just saw a bus literally parked on the side of the road that says they're going to Pokhara in about 10 minutes. So we paid our $4 and we're just waiting for it to take off now. And honestly, I kind of wanted to walk all the way back down to Nayapur just to complete the circuit. But from what it looks like, it's kind of just Jeep Road. And if a bus can drive on it, it's probably not something we want to hike on. So here we are uh, saying goodbye. And I want to introduce you to one of my trekking mates. It's the last part of the journey, Annika. You want to say hello? Uh, hi, I'm Annika from Finland. And uh, it's it have been nice nice days here. And recommend to everybody to go to Boon Hill Ro- Road or whatever road in Nepal. It's really amazing. And tiring as well, but worth it all the way. Yeah, so both you and your sister seem pretty exhausted today. What do you think that is? Yeah, because we are finished. Finish, I guess. That's why. (laughs) You're finished or you're finished? Finished. So here I am with two finished fins and me finishing my journey as well. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you do, make sure you subscribe to this podcast, share it with your friends, take a screenshot, whatever you have to do to get it out there. Um, and see you in the next episode. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Travel Like a Boss podcast. If you want to hear more, including the bonus, how to choose the perfect niche episode, join our mailing list at travellikeabosspodcast.com. See you next week. And remember, if you want to travel like a boss, you need to be your own boss. So start your online business today and start living the lifestyle you've always dreamed of.